When I was 11 years old, I lived in Taupo here in Aotearoa, New Zealand, and our nearby volcano, Mount Ruapehu, erupted. I remember seeing a giant grey ash cloud cover the otherwise blue sky. Ash fell in a light layer on our town, and I collected a little sample in a jar off our car bonnet. We could smell the sulphur in the air and hear the eruption booms. I thought it was a great adventure, but I still had to go to school. And my pregnant teacher was not so excited. In fact, she was incredibly anxious and refused to leave the classroom. My friend lived in, on a sheep farm where many of the animals died after eating the ash on the grass. My uncle was meant to be visiting us, but his flight got cancelled. We're all aware about how devastating natural hazard events can be, from volcanic eruptions to storms and floods, earthquakes, tsunamis, landslides and wildfire. But looking back on this eruption now, I realise that everyone has different things going on in their lives, meaning we're impacted in different ways. Humans are complex. What if there was a way for us to receive warnings before the event occurs that reflects those different situations? Would that be useful? Globally and here in New Zealand, some areas have been impacted really hard by cyclones, typhoons and hurricanes. One of the best ways that we can mitigate for events like this is to act before they occur using forecasts and warnings. Under a changing climate, we can expect weather-related hazards to become more severe. The forecasting of hazards has come a long way. Weather-related warnings are now much more accurate than they used to be, days or a week out from an event. In my role as a social scientist, I conduct research on how we can make forecasts and warnings more effective. I have seen how forecasts for geohazards have been improved. Over the past decade, we've produced forecasts for aftershocks following the Canterbury and Kaikoura earthquake sequences, eruptions for Fakari White Island, Ruapehu and Topol volcanoes, and for landslides following um, in Cyclone Gabriel earlier this year. Would it be more effective if our warnings were based on the level of impact rather than on the hazards? All of those types of warnings are still based on the level of hazard. Would this be possible? Weather warnings are also still based on the, have been based traditionally on the level of hazard. So the whole country might have the same threshold of 100 km per hour wind gusts or 60 miles per hour in order to trigger a warning. This is whether the area has a city on it or a rural farmland. But things are changing. The World Meteorological Organization has led the call for more meaningful warnings so that people understand what might happen to them, their families, livelihoods and properties. One of the ways that we can do that is to start developing warnings based on the level of impacts. These are referred to as impact-based warnings. So instead of having a blanket threshold to trigger a warning, it can be different in different locations. Now, in New Zealand, Wellington's threshold for triggering a warning is 120 km per hour for wind gusts. Whereas Auckland, the threshold is 100 km per hour. This is because Wellington gets so much more wind, and so they're more resilient. The people, infrastructure and trees can handle those 100 km per hour wind gusts. Would these kind of warnings be more effective? Well, I conducted research with New Zealand's Met Service to see whether impact-based warnings can change people's risk perceptions and prompt them to act. The results were promising. We found that the people who received the impact-based warnings had higher levels of understanding of what the consequences would be from a storm. They also had higher levels of concern about the event. So we know that having impact information in our warnings is more likely to change people's risk perceptions. Whether or not they're more likely to act is still a little unclear, so we're doing some more research to understand this further. 
Following our research, Met Service went on to introduce red weather warnings. These are issued when significant impacts are expected to occur. In February 2023, Cyclone Gabriel was forecast to sweep past Auckland City. Only two weeks earlier, significant flooding had occurred in Auckland from another storm. Because the catchment was already soaked, they knew that further flooding was more likely, so Met Service issued a red <coughs> warning. These red warnings are still issued on a regional basis. Many people were impacted in Auckland by these floods, but they were affected in different ways. What if there was a way for us to be able to produce warnings that differed on more of an individual basis? Here is my example of a future warning. Let's say I'm sitting in my kitchen and my device alerts me that in three days time a cyclone is forecast to hit my area causing flooding that's going to cut off my house and isolate my family for a week. The warning has a link to a shopping list that gives me ideas for supplies that I'm running low on and that can help me to act by clicking on it. It reflects what my family needs, including that I've got a cat and two children. It suggests I may wish to reschedule the haircut that I finally got around to booking. There's a link to information on how to prepare my weatherboard house. There's also a link to accommodation options should I wish to evacuate instead. Who sent this warning? Can it be trusted? How did it know that I've got a cat and two children and that I've got a haircut booked. Did my elderly neighbour get the same warning at the same time? National science and emergency management agencies don't tend to have individual information in real time about us, nor the time to write 5 million targeted warning messages. So how can this kind of warning possibly be produced? What if our digital footprints fed into warning systems? Tech giants have a lot of this data already in their systems. Maybe they could use our demographic data and our health-related information, our online search histories, perhaps even our house information, and maybe even access our online photos. In this way, they would know that I've got a cat and two children and I live in a weatherboard house and that my road is prone to flooding. Would that be useful? In addition to this, they could use our mobile phone location data to know where we might be in relation to where the forecast for the cyclone is. In this way, they would know that I've got a haircut booked and any other planned trips as well. By combining this information, they could calculate our individual risk levels. What's more, they could start to produce tailored guidance information using our digital footprints. A smart fridge would know what I do and don't have. They could cross-check that against a list of recommended emergency food items and prepare an online shopping order for me, helping me to act. The information about my location of my house, its design and its materials would inform whether I can clear the spouting and shut the windows and I'll be okay, or whether I can expect problems and should be evacuating instead. As well as our risk information, we could also have calculated for us our risk tolerance. This is the point at which we think it's time to do something in order to be a bit safer. Our many and varied responses to the COVID-19 outbreak demonstrates our very different levels of concern. Our purchase history would show whether we bought face masks, and the digital advertising boards with facial recognition software and shopping malls would show whether we actually wore them. Our mobile phone location would show whether we were happy to frequent crowded nightclubs or whether we preferred to stay at home or go to outdoor dining instead. Social media data and which articles we read would show the tech giants how we think and feel. By overlaying our individual risk information with our risk tolerance information, we could start to know when we want to be warned and what it should say. Artificial intelligence powered large language models could then use all of that underpinning data to write those tailored warnings. This 
could be the future of warnings. But I'm not necessarily saying it should be. There are a lot of potential issues with this kind of approach. Commercial gain could drive warnings instead of public good. The tech giants might decide just to ax the system when they don't want it anymore. We might receive multiple warnings from a variety of agencies, leading to increased anxiety and warning fatigue, which is cry-wolf syndrome. There are bound to be many privacy issues and biases in the algorithms. Now, whether an individual tech agency has all of that data that I mentioned or they share it between them, we don't know. But what we do know is that the power that they have over us is immense, meaning we accept their terms and conditions and we allow cookies in order to be able to use our mobile phones, apps and platforms. Our data is already out there and being used to provide us with products that it thinks we might be interested in, targeted advertising and Netflix suggestions. This scenario that I describe about tech giants using our digital footprints for warnings is not currently being used as far as I'm aware, but I think there's a very high chance that it will occur. We need to research every aspect of tailored warnings to see if there's any other way that we can go about producing these tailored warnings. For example, maybe we can provide our own preferences directly with a warning agency so that we can decide what do we want to be warned about and when and what should it say. If tech giants do use this sort of data to inform the warnings, then I think they need to be issued alongside and consistent with general, general more, more standard warnings to make sure that everyone gets a warning, whether they've got a smartphone and a digital footprint or not. Agreements need to be made between the tech giants and who hold all this data and could be producing these warnings and the governments and agencies and countries where existing warning systems are. We need to investigate how far down this digital footprint path we should go. But the tricky thing is that path is still being constructed and I'm not sure anyone knows where it is going. As stated by Dennis Gabor, the future cannot be predicted but it can be invented. So maybe when Ruapehu next has an eruption, or maybe in a few more years after that, we'll be able to produce these forecasts that are more tailored to what people need for their own empowerment of their response. Maybe a family with an 11-year-old budding scientist will receive safety information alongside how it's a good opportunity for curious kids to learn about volcanoes. Pregnant teachers could get health-related advice that's targeted to them. Farmers could get information about how to take care of their animals. And people with travel bookings could get flight disruption information before the eruption occurs. When you get a forecast or a warning in future, I encourage you to pay attention to it. Maybe one day you'll notice that it refers to your situation specifically and it's different to your neighbours. Think about how you would prefer to be warned so that you can take action and better weather the storms of tomorrow. Thank you.